I'm going to start with this because uh, this guiding like unlocking London's residential density is actually, I believe, the reason why we started the conversation. Um, this is a publication that actually comes out of a two-year period of research. And the research that was carried out started coming from a daylight consultancy company um, trying to get to grips with um, how come that every time that you assess anything uh, in a denser urban environment, you never seem to match the numbers you ought to. And as such, you need to try and find justifications as to why you think it's still OK for someone not to get the minimum ADF or to have VSCs which are less than ideal. Um, then it actually very quickly became a much wider conversation. Um, we work with a lot of different people, um, including planning consultants, uh, local authorities, developers, um, daylight reviewers, um, planning QCs. And the point was that if we were going to try and understand how daylight relates to the urban environment, we have to try and look into all of the other subjects that actually make up what the urban environment is and the way we experience it. So it, in my view, to try and uh, get some <coughs> clarity about how we go about daylight and sunlight in the city, um, we actually need to ask ourselves a lot more questions than just what is the minimum numbers that we should choose, um, which is not an easy task at all. But what I want to remind everyone is that the publication that was actually attached to the invite tries to address the question of urban density in London. It therefore discusses other matters apart from just daylight levels. It tries to look at the different experience you get in the city of London in particular, but other cities which are much denser than more rural settings. So urban grain, building typologies, and the role that amenity plays in creating the place we like to be in <coughs> is, to me, what we should be interrogating. So in this context, daylight levels, in my view, form part of the wider amenity concept. And what is amenity? Amenity is actually defined as the pleasantness, the character, and the quality of the built environment you live in. And this is key, in my view. So daylight levels are actually defined by the urban grain and the buildings that belong to that urban grain. And the opposite is also true that varying daylight and sunlight levels define those very different settings that we call urban grain or areas of London. And the variety of it all is what attracts us to London. So I'm just going to show you a few pictures of what I'm talking about. So this is an area of Islington. And as you can see, it actually includes <coughs> buildings of different type and sometimes they're just opposed in different ways. But in this part of London, as you can see, there is a lot of terrace housing, for instance, which is part of what London is. This is Covent Garden, on the other hand, and it is a completely different urban environment. Now, you don't have to really ask yourself whether you like one more than the other. You may like one more than the other at a different stage of your life. The point here is that the two completely different environments are still London. This could be kind of a hybrid of the two. This is the emerging London. And if you actually do uh, you know, a, a job related uh, to the construction industry or uh, the design industry, you realize that uh, more and more of London looks like this. This is actually one example of many schemes that are emerging and are being built at the moment, which result from the adoption and the application and the interpretation of the current guidance, actually the guidance uh, you know, that has been going for the last 10, 15 years, not just the daylight and sunlight, but all types of guidance. This is potentially the best example I could find of a high density but low rise environment in London, it's Malibon, and it is a mixed use part of London as well. Again, another part of London that a lot of people love. 
So if you were to ask yourself, and I think Andrew pointed this out right at the beginning, why are all of these different environments with all of the different buildings, with all of the different users and the different <coughs> type of people that live in it, trying to adhere to the same number is the question that I want to ask everyone because we find it incredibly hard to justify it in that way. To give you more examples, so Muse houses, you know, beyond what they were meant to do historically, today they'll be empty if someone didn't love living in there. The same goes for mansion blocks. This is kind of the normal block of a hundred years ago. It's actually quite a big revival of mansion blocks nowadays because they are seen as you know, buildings that actually deliver quite good level of daylight after all. But just so that you're aware, they don't achieve nowhere near the 25 degree or 27 VSC levels. And this is just an example of a contemporary block um, in London. So the background to all of this, uh, which needs to be understood, is not necessarily only one of health and well-being, which is incredibly important and incredibly complex to uh, arrive at. What are the key ingredients and how much of any ingredients you need to actually be healthy or happy. But in terms of trying to deliver housing and looking at the future of London, we need to develop <coughs> have more houses and there are certain things that need to be appreciated so for instance the fact that London in itself we call it a very dense city but there are many ways of defining density in terms of land use London is by no means a dense city is actually a city that offers a lot of land in a city center let alone the suburbs and let's not even start beyond the M25 but what the white paper, for instance, started looking into is how this land is used. And it's actually calling for making better use of it, whatever that actually then translates to in reality. The other thing that it actually points out is that when people are asked to picture high density <coughs> developments, they immediately think of something really dark, really dingy, or really tall. But effectively, if you think about Malibone or Chelsea, etc., London offers the opposite. It actually offers vast areas which achieve a much greater than average density in terms of land use, in terms of population. Um, and that's the actual prime of London in many, many different ways. The other document that is incredibly relevant is how the GLA, the London Plan, um, it's looking at amongst many other things, what are the policies that should be put in place to allow for London to grow and to try and do it in the best way possible. So this was published in 2016 and it actually includes something about daylight because it didn't used to before, surprisingly enough. But what it actually does, it tries to bridge um, the gap between uh, what the BRE guidance actually started, which is the whole concept of when you want to try and apply what's in this book flexibly, it actually means that you need to understand the context you're applying it into. Much like the example of the muse that you were giving before. A muse could work at 40 degree angle, another could actually be 45 or, or 25. It is not a one size fits all and that's not how it should be interpreted, yet that is how it is implemented. So. This sentence is, to me, quite a step change and it actually opens up the opportunity today to go out in London, find those areas that people love, study them, learn from them and understand why people like them. And daylight is obviously one of the metrics that can be studied. And by this I don't mean we should pick between VSC or ADF or UDIs or... It, it is not a matter of selecting which is the best scale. It's a matter of understanding how do we go and study things and what is the approach we want to take to learn from what's around us. So, this is the daylight group nonetheless, so how do we go about it in practice? 
And I just wanted to show you a few examples of how we are trying to go about this problem of learning from what's around us. So this is a, three, well, a very small part of a very large 3D model of London that we're building. At the moment, we have about 280 square kilometers of it. And by in 12 months' time, we will have covered the whole of the M25 ring. So at that point, we will actually have pretty much all we need to work within the M25 and the ability to study if we wanted to. So this is an example of every facade which lacks the detail and that it is caveat in our reports, you know, but the accuracy of the buildings is 15 centimeters and so the distances between buildings is correct. Um, and you can start to look at very large data to suggest what are the numbers that go hand in hand with certain urban grains, for instance, as a means to understand <coughs> how light defines the urban grain and the reverse. You can then take all of those dots, which are single VSC levels, for instance, and bring them back into a tool that allows you to l interrogate the information. So here is just a screenshot of a GIS map we developed, whereby you can then group all of this facade details, and you can start studying the average at several floor heights, ground first, second, for instance, you know, block by block, or by postcode, or by <coughs> wards, or, or you decide. There is even a tool that allows you to just draw an area and understand what the numbers are. You can do the same with sunlight. And the interesting thing, when you actually step back from the individual window, but you try and look at the city as a whole, is that you realize that over London, that variety of spaces and grain have completely different rhythms of daylight and sunlight that accompany the architecture and the local character. So it is completely unsurprising, probably, to <laughs> understand that in a, in a dense environment like this, the streets play a role, the public areas play a role, the courtyard play a role, and they all play a role within the amenity of the place but always a very different one, which we're still interrogating, though, with the same metric, same threshold every time. And here I wanted to give you actually a proper worked out example of the direction that we are taking, you know, at GIA. Um, this is actually one example of a number of study areas um, that we are now putting forward together with um, the proposed scheme when this is uh, um, appropriate. And it doesn't actually venture 50 miles out. And it actually states all of the assumptions made. And it tries to work out the area, not the proposal alone, before you then go into the detail of the single unit that is impacted. So this is 10 Broadway and a picture of what it actually looks like. It actually is partly here and partly there. But there is also extra consented scheme in the area that you can add. We have defined which areas are in conservation, which are not, and how the two um, face each other. And most importantly, when we do the studies, we do not take only the impacts around you know, the proposed, but we actually take a large enough area to represent the character of that piece of London. You can obviously interrogate it with the VSC scale, which you can break down in various ways. So you can look at uh, the distribution on ground floor, first floor, second floor, whether there is a commercial versus domestic uh, user ground floor that justifies comparing that side to the other side. I mean, these data are available on the London, London data store if you go and find that it's all open source. We can interrogate the actual footprint on the site, so the land use, the distribution of heights of buildings. And when you start taking these elements, this is the total overshadowing, the actual face-to-face fa -face distances. Why are we fixated with 18 meters face-to-face? -face? It's so unrepresentative of the majority of what people love in London. It's beyond me. but. There you go, you can actually take uh, all the streets and measure them and understand what are the actual averages. And once you start doing this with, all, with your site 
and all of the other side that are representative, actually a picture emerges which can easily be discussed with the local authority, which in the schemes that we have done actually took part in the process and was willing to suggest schemes that they aspire to reproduce because they are the best that has come forward in the borough. So you can start comparing what is deemed to be the best, not just the worst. And the most important thing is that we always go back to the things that we experience. No one understands what a 27 VSC is if you don't relate it back to something you have experienced. No one exactly knows what 1.5% ADF feels like. It's a completely varying scale. And but what we all understand is I can walk down the street or that street or the other street, I can experience the space, I can actually be inside building and, and have a say for myself. So it's very important that we always relate the data back to the real world. So now here I'm doing a little jump that takes me back to what I was saying uh, at the beginning. Daylight, the way we are interpreting it, is part of the wider amenity that people enjoy. Is one aspect, and actually these are not my words, but they are poles in the guidance. Uh, you know, it, that's obvious to everyone, but sometimes we just like to put th things in different silos because we can actually grasp them better, but that's not how the real world actually works. <coughs> And when it comes to understanding daylight and sunlight, we need to be able to put it back into some kind of context. So if you take open space, not amenity space, open space, which seems to nowadays translate to green spaces, but it isn't. Amenities are a whole ensemble of things that we love. But if you take open space, I wonder why a park is actually treated similarly to a street if we were you know, to assess it using the usual metrics. But then in planning, sometimes it isn't, right? They cover different roles. There is a need for one and the other. Why is one more of an amenity than the other? So isn't there like a way that we can put this together? Because if you did a very simple analysis, for instance, and this is more like a, a cheeky joke than anything else, but a park, we all are aware, it's beautiful, and in London, it's th they are absolute assets. But this is the weather that we have 80% of the time, maybe 90. <laughs> so very hard to make use of all of that space. Canopy Street, this is the difference. You either wear a t-shirt or you wear a raincoat. So there could be other ways of interrogating the use of spaces. But in reality, this is what I was trying to say. This is what we perceive as making up a place. And to try and find a way to put these together including Bella and Sanna, in my mind, would end up producing more meaningful policies if we want to keep on developing and inhabiting the city. So uh, I'm going to conclude with this slide. Um, if I were to ask all of you guys uh, what a suburban area feels like or what a city centre feels like, I bet that you will all respond more or less similar. You would have in your head a picture of all of that complexity before already worked out because you've experienced it, right? You would know that if you go a little bit outside, you would have plenty of light, you would have plenty of fields, you would have probably plenty of schools for children. You know, if you are in the city center, you're struggling for the very opposite, but maybe that's what you want or that's what you like. Point being, I believe that the beauty of London is that it is all three and all of grey in between. That's what is what, what makes London an interesting place. And the the actual concept is represented by a pie chart because that's probably the only analogy that I could find that <coughs> kind of suits. You know, it is if you are trying to develop a new area and you're trying to mix the same ingredients in the same way you are very likely to bake the same cake. Hence the Elephant Park scheme and all of the new regenerations would tend to look very similar. But if, on the other hand, you envision the space you want to create, the place you want to obtain, and then you study what defines it, you may be able to define what proportion needs to go into to create a different cake each time. So to sum it up, 
if it is true that varying day light and sunlight levels define the character of different urban environments, to deliver variety in our urban environment, we must first envision what we want to create. And then we can go out and study the levels of light which help define it. Thank you.